I'd like to introduce uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Ariel Anbar, uh, geochemist and the director of the Center for Education Through Exploration at ASU, which is the organization that has put forth these virtual field trips. And I'm going to be turning it over to him in just a moment because he's going to introduce ETX. Um, also on the line is Jeffrey Bruce, the, uh, the lead developer, designer, guru of the virtual field trips who will be uh, participating in the end with uh, a question and answer. Uh, he is responsible for, for pretty much everything that you're going to see today uh, in, in designing and developing them and several other members of our uh, center, which we abbreviate as ETX, are also online. So, uh, Ariel, if you're ready to go, uh, sure. do you have the slides or do you want me to advance them? It's okay, I'll, I'll stop sharing and then I'll let oh, Okay, I can share. Okay. I'll share. Right. That's fine. Okay. Just give me a second here to share from my end. Uh, if I can find them. I can always bring mine back. Um, I'm, uh, I'll do that. I'll go ahead and bring mine back and you can just tell me to advance. So great. Yeah, I'm just puzzled. It's not showing up on my share screen. Okay. Very strange. All right. So yeah, if you want to advance the slide one. Okay. There's probably about a five second delay since we have the web thing yeah, here. Yeah, those are too big. So yeah, so um, what we're gonna do is just give you a very, very high level overview of some of what we've been doing with virtual field trips in the Center for Education Through Exploration. So just a quick word about the center. Uh, so I oversee the center here at ASU. Um, and we are philosophically all about figuring out how to transform learning to embrace exploration of the unknown, not just mastery of what is known and to do that in ways that scale. And so that's kind of highfalutin language for saying that we're trying to um, uh, advance inquiry-driven learning in various ways. Um, and uh, uh, virtual field trips were one of the first things that we started doing. Uh, and they continue to be something that we're, that we're doing in, in a continually evolving fashion. Um, and the center is uh, soft money funded. You can see here the NASCAR logos of various sources of funding. Um, and that's by way of saying that we've, we've had many opportunities to experiment and refine what we're doing with different audiences and, and really come to some serious understanding of what um, um, what makes for good virtual field trips and, and, and what, what things to avoid. Um, and also we've had the opportunity to experiment with very many, a number of different technology, technological approaches. Uh, next slide. It is slow. All right. So um, if you uh, want to ex play with any of the things that, uh, or at least some of the things we're going to show you today, um, this website, which I should have put the URL larger, uh, vft.asu.edu is open to the public and, and you, can ex you can play around with different virtual field trips that are at different levels of uh, sophistication and, and complexity to create. Um, uh, the uh, featured one here is uh, our latest and greatest uh, which we call uh, Surviving Extinction. It's really a virtual field trip based game or a game that has virtual field trips layered into it um, as well as, as virtual reconstructions of ancient environments So not the field trips of the modern, but the reconstruction of what, they, what it looked like in the past. Uh, it's very cool, very sophisticated. Um, um, we welcome your feedback both on content and any technical issues that you might see. Um, it's not an exemplar of what, what we expect is particularly useful for, for folks here in terms of wanting to develop your own VFT, but it does give you an example of, of, of things that are possible uh, when you really go down this road. Um, next slide, Steve. But what you'll also find on this site are a number of things that are much more accessible from a development standpoint because they're some of the earliest things that we did uh, when we stepped into this whole virtual field trip space. Um, we stepped into this not with the idea of doing fancy educational games um, or sophisticated adaptive experiences. We stepped into this uh, starting about 10 years ago when I was PI of a NASA Astrobiology Institute team and, and for educational outreach thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could take um, uh, or give, give students especially, but also scientists, the experience of quote unquote going to uh, important uh, geological field sites um, uh, that teach about history of life and environment on Earth. So these very important astrobiology field sites. Uh, in particular, we were doing, a, our team was doing a lot of work in Western Australia. And so we have a number of, of Western Australia virtual field trips. This is one of them uh, to Kirigini, um, Kirigini Gorge. So classic banded iron formation locality. And some of these are actually very simple. They're essentially just 360 degree spherical images with videos layered in 
without any kind of sophisticated feedback or anything like that. And so Steve is going to walk you through some sophisticated stuff, um, um, and but that's built on top of this sort of thing. But they're relatively simple things you can do if you have access to the field site, access to um, the right technology, uh, and and we we'd be glad to talk you through those sorts of things down the road. Um, next slide, Steve. You want me to do this one too? I think. So, so what we, yeah, so I'll do this one, Steve, and then hand it over to you. So what we uh, focus on really are browser-based uh, experiences that try without too much technical overhead, technological overhead to give you that you are there feeling. Um, that was our design goal 10 years ago when we set out to, to create something that felt more immersive than just seeing pictures or little quick time videos. And so we ended up with this 360 degree spherical technology and learning how to layer in videos, GigaPan images and, um, and, and other assets on top of that. Um, that's the base that we do, uh, that we learned how to do and that is relatively accessible. It's, it's much more accessible now than it used to be because of, as most of you know, doing 360 degree spherical images, which used to be a sophisticated, difficult thing to do is now relatively easy to do. Although if you want it to be you know, super high resolution. It's still it's still somewhat complex, but but it's accessible to anybody who's motivated. Um, we then that's, that's first bullet. Second bullet is that we then learned, and this is where it starts to get more more sophisticated, more complex. That uh, for many of our applications with actual students, we wanted to coach students through these experiences, and we were creating paper lesson plans to do that, and that seem kind of silly. You have this sophisticated technological platform and a paper lesson plan. We wanted to have adaptive feedback within the experience that would guide students through. And then, and so then we started working with software packages that enable us to do that. That gets to a higher level of design that may be beyond what, what, what this group wants to do or needs to do in the immediate term. But I think Steve's going to walk you through some of that. Um, and the third bullet here is just in, in general, we're trying to make things as interactive as possible. Um, uh, and there's, there's this sliding scale of the more interactive you want to make it for the student, the more complexity there is in design. And so you've got to think through where, what's your sweet spot for your application. Um, so Steve, I'm going to turn this over to you then and uh, have you walk through an example. Uh, yes. Uh, let me get the screen sharing back on again. Um, and I'm going to get onto the web here. And I'm going to mute so you don't hear the dog barking in the background. Let's see. Okay, let's um, let's share that. So hopefully everybody can see this now. Can you see the uh, the window, the VFT window? Again. So when you go when you go to the VFT website, this is what you'll see. the The surviving extinction is our new and exciting product. So it's there on the splash page. But on the bottom, there's this sliding menu with all of the, the virtual field trips that are available and ones that we still have uh, in progress. And some of them have a bar across them that say that there's an adaptive learning or an adapted adventure that's been enabled. And that means that we have uh, the adaptive uh, technology in there to respond to student uh, behaviors during the field trip and provide information that helps guide them through it. And uh, some of these field trips are, are dual purpose in that we have an open inquiry section where students basically can navigate through the field locality any way they want to go. They can pop up uh, different uh, educational aids like videos and images, but they're not guided in any particular sequence. And then the uh, adaptive uh, in, uh, the adaptive lesson guides them through a particular sequence. So I'm going to bring you now to Grand Canyon. Okay, we have this specific Grand Canyon field trip, which I'm uh, very proud of as a Grand Canyon geologist. Uh, the content for this field trip was captured during a 2013 river trip with the uh, uh, team with uh, Carl Karlstrom at University of New Mexico. You know, many of you know, has done extensive research in the Grand Canyon area. And we, uh, Carl and, and Lori Crossy, both at UNM, are, are featured in this video as well as several, uh, sorry, featured in this VFT as well as uh, several others of us. So when you, when you open up the Grand Canyon, you have uh, several different options. One is this, uh, we go to the next page, there's an unguided exploration, which I'm gonna show you first for a few minutes. And that's the one that, that has all of the assets, but it allows the instructor or the students to navigate uh, freely any way they wanna go uh, at, any, at any pace. Um, the Mystery of Blacktail Canyon is an embedded adaptive lesson that focuses on the great unconformity. 
and it, it brings students to an understanding of what unconformities are and, and what the, uh, the great amount of time that's recorded in this particular unconformity in, in Grand Canyon. Blacktail Canyon is one of the best exposures of the great unconformity in the entire Grand Canyon. Uh, before I start, I wanted to say, and you know, I realized having been part of this task force from the start that uh, a lot of what we've been seeing have been tools and uh, and virtual experiences that are specifically oriented toward advanced field, toward summer field camp and advanced field geology training. And um, we freely acknowledge that, that what we've developed here was not developed with that in mind. I will point out, however, that we've used these field trips very successfully in lower division courses like physical and historical geology and uh, geology in the Southwest, which is actually an upper division course. Um, so they do have a value for, for particular courses. And you know, some of you may actually be concerned about field trips for lower division geoscience courses over the summer and subsequent uh, semesters. And you might like to make use of some of the tools we've had here. Um, and you know, also if, if you're just looking for a lot of multimedia rich content on some of the world's greatest geologic localities, we uh, we're happy to, to offer that to you. So let's start with the unguided exploration. When you click on that icon, it brings you not to the start of, and then you get another window here that says click the start button. Now, those of you who know the Grand Canyon might be a little surprised because what we decided to start you at the classical beginning of a river trip, which is Lee's Ferry at mile zero, but we actually bring you down here to uh, Nankaweep Canyon, which is a, a fairly well-known locality uh, in Grand Canyon with a lot of uh, uh, different resources. Now, hopefully people can hear the, uh, the birds. Okay, we have sound effects in here. Uh, when you enter the virtual field trip, the first thing you're into is a is the 360 degree panorama. And this one was filmed on the edge of the Nankaweep Granaries, a ledge in the uh, red wall limestone that looks down over uh, the rest of Grand Canyon down there. And uh, you'll notice that the, uh, the 360 uh, panorama is also embedded with different kinds of icons. And each icon tells you about different uh, tools. So for example, if we click on this, a video will pop up, a, a box of videos that introduce different aspects these essentially explanatory videos that talk about the geology of that particular location. And so um, I'll show you one of these. And, and these are all embedded in YouTube, so you can actually see them separately. So you get the idea of what we have there. We have a, a considerable number of videos uh, that feature multiple scientists that were on this trip talking about aspects of the of the geology that are that are relevant. Um, there's also a couple of kind of fun video uh, that that you might use to sort of illustrate what it's like to be on the river. We have this great uh, video here of uh, I'll move it ahead a little bit of uh, riding rapids. Steve, just so you know, I think those are coming up in pop up windows, and the rest can't see it through Zoom. I'm sorry, was that, you can't see this? No, now we can. Are you not able to see this video? We can see it now, but it's, it's coming through really slowly, Steve. Let me look at the chat. Sorry, I just heard, was that, Basil, was that you? That's correct. So we are just getting like snapshots as you go through. It's not okay, playing I'm not sure. video. Are, are people hearing me? Are we there? Am I lost? Okay, oh, I see. Okay, I got it. the videos coming through poorly. All right, well, I won't, I won't show any more of the videos then, but they are there, okay? What we also have is we have Gigapan images, all right? So we can, uh, we can bring up, uh, again, I apologize for the poor uh, quality. I'm, I'm reporting to you from a remote area of Arizona. So um, let me bring up the Gigapan. We have a number of Gigapan images. Uh, I think most people are familiar with them, a, a bunch of high resolution photographs that are stitched together by software so that you have an image that allows you to simultaneously have high resolution at a great distance and a high resolution close up. So one of the things that's really kind of cool about um, about Gigapan in this environment is that a great deal of the geology of Grand Canyon is not readily accessible because unless you're a, a mountain goat or a uh, uh, technical rock climber. And the nice thing about the Gigapan is it allows students to explore 
aspects of the geology that you normally couldn't access either on the ground from a hiking trail or even from the river. Okay, so the other thing that, that we can do here, of course, is we can navigate up and down the river. So there are icons here that, uh, that allow you to move up and down. So we click on this next arrow, we come down to mile 60, which was captured at the uh, 60 mile rapids. And uh, it's a particularly good outcrop of the Tapete sandstone. So again, we have uh, great illustrations of, of things such as worm burrows in the Tapete sandstone. Whoops, sorry, it keeps going, zooming in and out there. So you, you could have students make observations of lithology, of fossils, of bedding. Um, we don't have a feature in there yet for measuring attitudes, but uh, you can still make a considerable number of observations on the geology in all of these locations. So I'll close the, the gigapan. The other thing that we have here, and I will bring this up over here. We are linked to a Google map uh, satellite view and uh, on it are a bunch of place marks. And so another way that you can navigate the field trip is to click on a particular place mark and that will instantly bring you down river. So we were at mile 62 a moment ago, we're now, at mile 150 in the river. Okay, so we're now at a completely different location. And again, we have uh, a number of videos. This is uh, the Deer Creek Canyon, uh, one of the tributaries of, of Grand Canyon. And we're in the Tapete Sandstone again. And just like before, we have a number of these, uh, these photographs, uh, like for example, trace fossils in the, in the Tapete Sandstone. Can people see those? Yes, we can see those. Okay. So anyway, we have this, this free inquiry Grand Canyon field trip where you can navigate you know, pretty much all the way down the canyon, every single location. Uh, there's Carl Karlstrom. We have videos on, on him talking about the Great Unconformity. Um, this is the Narrows in Grand Canyon. This is the place where the basement rocks kind of come in very tight on the river, the narrowest spot on the Colorado River. But pretty much you can go anywhere you want all the way down to the Grand Wash Cliffs, which is the end of the Grand Canyon right there. And every one of these these stops on the trip that starts with the 360 degree spherical also has all of the embedded resources, the, the gigapans, the photographs, the videos, and, uh, and so on that allow you to, uh, to interrogate the locality in, in some detail. So I'm gonna stop with the free exploration one right now and, and show you very uh, quickly the, um, the adaptive learning exploration, the Blacktail Canyon. Okay, which hopefully will open up here. Okay, so this is, again, I'll give you a moment for this to load. Okay. Yeah, I, I apologize for the, uh, the data issues. Um, maybe we should have had somebody else do this in another location. Um, we are running short on time, but I'm gonna show you the um, Black Tail Canyon very quickly, where we can enter into this adaptive learning environment. And what it does essentially is it, it allows you, uh, it, it queries students on the geology of the Great Unconformity and it allows them to explore the Great Unconformity, um, zooms in on particular aspects of the canyon wall. And 
and if you're following this, I'm going through this rather quickly, but there's a, uh, there's a box on the left side that, that introduces tech terminology and guides the student as they're moving through it. Um, and then we pop up into an area where they can expand on these images in great detail. They can look at the, the contacts, um, think about the rock units that are present. They can also uh, illustrate the great unconformity with the, uh, you can sort of zoom in on, on the lithology of the Tapete Sandstone and the um, Elves Chasm Nice, which is underneath there. And there are also embedded videos um, in here. Okay, so here we have a particularly good cross section of the of the uh, Grand Canyon. And then, and then we start to ask questions, students, how many different rock units are exposed here? Can they work with the contacts? And what this does is it essentially walks students through the idea of a nonconformity. They compare the, the lithology of the metamorphic rock on the bottom and the sedimentary rock on top and, and come to an understanding of how um, unconformities work and how it relates here. So I'm going to uh, stop with that now. And uh, I'm going to now go back to the slides because I know we're starting to run out on time. Uh, I just wanted to very quickly talk about some of the things that we're moving ahead on. Let's see. Let me get the share in here again. Okay. Okay. So in the process of... Um, Creating these, we're also very interested in research on their effectiveness. We're concerned about the fact that sometimes the technology goes out way in advance of the learning research that goes along. And we have been conducting some research on the effectiveness of these uh, virtual field trips. One was an interesting uh, study that was done by uh, our master's student, Tom Roberto, where he essentially looked at courses in which we offered the option of a virtual field trip and an in-person field trip to Grand Canyon to the students and compared the outcomes. And what he found was that, first of all, the IVFT could be developed in such a way so that students could meet the exact same learning outcomes as they get in the in-person field trip. Um, but the, the virtual field students actually showed greater and, and sig more statistically significant pre-post gain in content knowledge. Uh, more significantly, I think, is that uh, participating in the virtual field trip actually encouraged students to take an in-person field trip in the future. We think it, it helped them get over some of the preoccupations that novice students might have with field work, uh, the idea of novelty space, Orion and Hofstein, some people may be familiar with that work, that, that essentially introducing students to the field through the virtual field trip first uh, actually paved the way for them wanting to participate in actual field trips in the future. Another study where one of our other vir virtual field trips in Australia, the Nilpina field trip, was uh, used in different settings, learning settings, high school and undergrad graduates. Um, and we found that students in both groups did show large and statistically significant gains in learning objectives. So we thought that the, the VFT, it, it illustrates the value of VFTs in teaching. Um, what we've been doing lately is we've been involving from a, a model where we're primarily creating high-end virtual field trips, uh, which we still do. We're still uh, Surviving Extinction is a good example of one that just came out, but we've gotten very interested in ways of teaching educators and students to create their own virtual field trips, uh, a little bit more technologically simple. They use readily available inexpensive technology and uh, educators and students essentially migrate from being primarily consumers of virtual field trips to producers of virtual field trips. And we've actually offered two courses now, one last year and one this spring that we're just concluding on uh, creating virtual field trips. The first was for sustainability. It was co-taught with a sustainability school. And the one just completing now is creating VFTs for teaching earth and space sciences. And this is a basic summary of the, the syllabus, basic pedagogy, place-based teaching, storytelling, the use of technologies. And other than $300 or so Rico Theta 360 degree cameras, which we purchase and lend to them. Uh, everything else that they use is their own stuff, their own cell phones. Uh, we have very simple audio recorders that we provide for them. And, and they learn to design and create a VFT, go out and capture their own assets, build the VFT on a platform, which is currently Smart Sparrow. We'll touch base on that a little bit. Um, and the main thing about the course is that there's a great deal of, uh, of group interaction and troubleshooting because of the time it takes to, uh, to complete these. Um, I wanted to point out that the class is actually concluding tonight and we're going to be having a Zoom where the, the two student groups who created their virtual field trips are actually going to premiere their VFTs to the class and to, to other interested uh, observers. And if by any chance you'd like to 
to uh, tune in on that, just send me an email, uh, semkin at asu.edu. It's at 4.30 p.m. today, uh, Pacific Arizona time. So I know that's a little bit late for the East Coast, but we welcome anybody who'd be interested. I'd rather just have you email me about that because we're going to have a waiting room. Uh, for that, but you're welcome to see what the students have done. Uh, what I'm going to do, though, is in the, about the next minute or so, is very quickly show you what can be done at this level, and and that is that we have a um, a solar energy field trip uh, VFT that was created by um, Dr. Cyan Proctor. Okay, Dr. Proctor is a uh, faculty member at South Mountain Community College in Arizona, but she's also a research scientist at ETX. And she used a fairly basic template that uh, Jeff Bruce created for us that uh, to, to construct a virtual field trip dealing with solar energy. Okay, so I'm going to now bring that up. Okay, I know we're running out of time. Hopefully everybody can now see that virtual field trip. It has a different interface from the, the other ones that ETX is doing, but it allows students to navigate through a bunch of themes dealing with solar energy. And again, like the higher end VFTs, it has a very high resolution 360 degree panorama, and it has different nodes embedded in it that allow students to learn something about what they're seeing. And so this is a solar energy site here and the major aspects of the solar energy site are illustrated. Uh, you can also, students can navigate back and forth through there uh, and they can, they can learn about it. There are embedded videos in a lot of these different uh, nodes that Cyan created. There are also embedded questions to test students on knowledge as they move around. And so we have videos on, on solar energy at home, solar covered parking, solar energy on campus, um, We can go back to home and Cyan also went to Hawaii and was at the high seas habitat in Hawaii, a uh, Mars test bed and created a, uh, a part of that to show how solar energy might be used in the future in space exploration. So I wish we had more time to navigate through all this, but this is the level of VFT that students and instructors can, can learn to do with pretty much off the shelf technology and uh, not investing a whole lot of time. Sam put a great deal of time. This is, a, this is an excellent virtual field trip, uh, but it's an illustration of what we're working on teaching students to be able to, uh, to do. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, we'll go back to the slides. We have a moment of, if, if Basil and everybody will allow us maybe just a couple minutes for uh, for question and answer. Absolutely. So you can ask Steve questions or maybe easier to just type them in the chat box and then he can read them all. But if you want to just okay. ask verbally, that's fine. Thanks everybody. Let me, uh, let me address the question that Ryan is asking about Smart Sparrow. Um, so we use Smart Sparrow for the um, adaptive feedback. Um, so if, if the kind of experience where you click on something and then you get a, a box saying, no, do this, oh, you didn't do this right, oh, you did this right, and so on and so forth. Um, so Sparrow's uh, technology has been purchased by Pearson. Um, so we're now in the process of working with a coalition out in the community led by Carnegie Mellon, uh, most likely. Um, to um, develop an open source alternative to doing the kind of things that we've been doing uh, in terms of the adaptive feedback and, and eventually move our stuff over to that. Uh, but a lot of what we do also with virtual field trips is completely free of Smart Sparrow. That surviving extinction game that I mentioned at the beginning is done completely, you know, hard coded. Uh, Jeff Bruce put that together. Um, and the templated uh, do-it-yourself sort of virtual field trip, um, while that currently uses the Sparrow platform, there's no reason that it, that it has to. Um, that was just a tool of convenience, and we're, we're in the midst of developing our own uh, uh, toolkit for that. I don't know if Jeff or Steve want to comment on that at all, but uh, the, 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 Sparrow, the Sparrow purchase by Pearson is 
annoying and stressful in certain ways, but it's not something that we can't deal with and it's actually creating interesting opportunities. Yeah, Ariel, I think the, the point is that we, we use Star uh, Sparrow because it had uh, some capabilities that we're familiar with. Um, uh, the way that template is set up, I think there's another question about how long it takes to develop one of those. Using the template is pretty straightforward because we're using iframes to just bring in 360 imagery. Um, and so what we're doing is we're building a, uh, a very similar version of that uh, outside of a platform to where we can have it uh, as a, a free entity, so to speak, that you can, as a, as a professor or teacher, can go in there or have your students go in there and try to build. We're just kind of working with the technology so it's outside it's kind of platform agnostic but the time period um, using the template Tom might um, answer this a little bit better because he's been working with his students but depending on how familiar with the technology and gathering the, the content is probably the more time-consuming um, uh, coming up with the lesson that you'd want to teach as well but uh, putting the content in is simply just populating the template with the, the, the content that you already gathered and we have uh, funding from the Department of Education on a totally different project that we think will align nicely with creating a really slick version of this template tool. Um, so we're in the early stages of, of designing that, but, but we think we'll in the end be able to have a pretty nice, uh, friendly way of doing this kind of template of VFTs that will not be dependent on any third party technology or any third party technology that isn't open source. So I've, I posted the, um, the link to Cyan's uh, solar VFT on, in the chat, and uh, we'll go ahead and um, we'll share these slides on the, on the NAGT workspace so that you'll have all of the, uh, the links. And again, I apologize for the poor quality of getting the videos across there. Um, but uh, anyway, please come and have a look at those. And again, anybody who wants to see what our students have done this semester is welcome to email me and I'll send you the link to the Zoom tonight. All right, I think we, even with the video problems, which were really pretty minor, Steve, I think uh, we got a really nice idea about what you've done and it's really great stuff. So thank you, all three of you, for uh, showing us that today. Thanks, Basil, and thanks everybody for, for giving some time. All right, um, maybe Steve, if you can stop sharing and then Ben can start sharing his screen and then we'll go from I there. I believe I have stopped. Okay, great. All right, great. We are now seeing Ben's screen and Ben, take it away. Yes, hi. I am uh, Ben van der Pleim. I'm a stay-at-home geologist at the University of Michigan. Um, I uh, was interested in this, obviously like everybody else, we couldn't do our trips and I thought I wanted to see whether I could do something myself on Sunday afternoon so I can put together a trip that tells students what they can see. The show and tell part of field camp is still uh, still alive for, for many of us. And so, um, I realized there are a few, there are many environments, but I wanted to see something that I could do myself without needing more than uh, uh, a whole team to, to, to build this forward. The other thing that really motivated me to think about this was that I really did a lot of those trips that people put together. I'm very impressed with many of these activities, but at the same time, I wanted something that's more personal, sort of more like how I talk about the stuff that I do. So it, 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 it uh, fits more with how I teach. And so I wanted to personalize the experience for the students that I'm, I'm dealing with so they know what is coming. Um, and that's where the voiceover part comes in, which was the motivation of this uh, project to begin with. Um, but what I will do is I'll walk you through this, uh, just some of the functionality that we put in there. And as I walk you through this, I will uh, uh, tell you what we have done and what, and what is different. And then I'll do the crazy thing that everybody tells you not to do. I'll try to show you one example where I will do this in, all in one minute to make a new stop on a few trips so that you can actually see you can do this. There's a lot of stuff behind this as you go forward. So the environment that I picked, because it's already exciting to begin with, was um, uh, Google Earth Web. Google Earth Web is different from the desktop version. It runs on the web. And once uh, we get this stuff going, uh, there's links in there, and you can run this entirely on your cell phone, on your tablet. Uh, that's the power of Google Earth Web. It doesn't have any of the local software requirement that uh, Google Earth Desktop has. And so this runs on any 
platform, typical platform that has access to the internet. So, so let me go and, and, and walk you through this um, as we go forward. I don't see the, the, the chat question because I have the screen sharing on, so I'll, I'll, I'll just keep rattling on until Basil tells me to slow down or stop. Um, but um, I have time to answer questions, of course. If you get the link from this trip, this is the example trip, you open, this is the screen that you see. Um, it's a standard Google Earth web screen. And so, uh, however, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll start the, the trip. Um, and those of you familiar with it uh, will immediately recognize that the big, big difference that we've done is you've taken control of the info panel on the right side. The info panel on the right side is not part of the typical Google Earth web overlay. It actually is we add something to this to allow us to put information on that particular site. And, I, and this is where most of the stuff that I will talk about will go because that's the new functionality. And just to show you the examples already that we, we can do, obviously we can add fi figures, pictures. We always could. But also what we've done, we have started to embed the videos that are Actually, I cannot. Uh, so well, then I just, just realize that we can either hear you or the music then. No, 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 I, I realize that. I, I actually feed the music through the uh, screen share. That's why it's so loud. I, I turn it off. Um, so there's text down here. The text is nicer than it was before because you can actually put hot links in and I'll show you some more examples as you go forward. But basically, this is the opening screen of the system that you, that you get into. And the power of it is you can simply add more information. You can actually let students read things. You can have stuff on the site. Uh, you can go in there. You can add figures there. You can add images there, as you can see. And we have hot links in there. Um, and um, basically, you can, the introduction already gives you more flexibility to guide students. So uh, let's go to one example uh, stop to show you what we've done. <clears throat> Um, right over here. Google Earth, of course, lets you set up where you want to go, where the stops are. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you can set up the way you like it. You can set up the screen the way you like it. And here's already on the side panel is what matters. So we can put in figures, but also we can put captions to the figures. We can put text there, which you can't do in, in the standard version to begin with. So you can give people some information of, of where they are. That's helpful. The other thing that really started this project, and I'm sorry it's going to be very loud, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll play it. It won't be very long. You can personalize it. Beautiful overlook that has the Catoctin core in the valley and surrounded by ridges that are held up by lower Paleozoic quartzitic rocks. Obviously, it's a very short clip, and the point is you can make it as long as you want. But this is functionality that allows you to have voiceover while the students explore the screen as they go forward. We build out a little bit more in preparation of showing the show and tell. Obviously, another field picture you can show. Um, I put a map in there, as you can see, this is handy with a map. But you could also make it a little bit more sophisticated. Sorry for the noise. Look, a rock, a shale. It's not from the Appalachians, it's from the Gladonites, but it's pretty similar. I don't have uh, video clips of the outcrops because I wasn't ready for that. I didn't prepare it that way. Uh, so I just showed you that you could put any video clip in there that you want uh, to allow you to either show something or simply use video clips from the field. And I hope that somebody will have a fantastic series of videos from their field trip. We can build together an example. Uh, is there. Otherwise, the text has stuff in there. You can now add figures in the text, which you can't do in the normal version. Uh, you can add links in there at the bottom. There's a help link if you click on that help link in that particular way. So, so really, there's, that, that's all this added functionality. Um, let me show you another example. Uh, of course, there's hands-on materials you can do now. You, obviously, students, uh, classic outcrop, round top, railroad cut in, uh, in Maryland. Most everybody who's in the Appalachians has been at that outcrop and, and showed the pictures uh, of that outcrop. Uh, there's nothing special that if you haven't seen it, but otherwise it's a fantastic place to go with beautiful structures. But here uh, you can now also embed activities in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the area. And if I click on this, you won't see anything till I actually go to the, uh, Actually, you will see something, um, and uh, Google Earth is always tricky when you do this. Uh, there you go. Uh, just the instructions of how to do an activity. 
um, for that particular site. And so you, you can start to add whatever activity you want. And you can link that still to this framework of the original type of, uh, of setting that, uh, that, that, that we have. So activities are not developed because it's show and tell, but we do activities in the field and you can add that to that description in there. Um, I'll show you another example of a famous place and, and, and try a little uh, trickier thing. Uh, Sidling Hill, uh, one of those locations. And by the way, look on the screen, of course, from, from, from Google, what I haven't shown you yet, but nothing has changed in the functionality that you have. You can still, the student, or you can still move this around any way you like, uh, even the, uh, without the panel getting in the way. And that's one of the advantages you can zoom in and zoom out as you uh, go in these things. Um, a little thing that's kind of fun uh, it, that is we play with. Um, you could also uh, put in um, um, a gigapans. Here's a gigapan of that outcrop. If I'm wrong shot, and you can actually see if you go in the uppermost part, which you normally can't see very well, you can keep zooming in and you see beautiful structures whereby the top moves uh, in, a, in, a, in a westerly direction, which is exactly what the Appalachians do as a general setting. So the gigapan is, is, is something you can play with. Uh, in addition to, to other features that you have. Um, and I kind of think that's a, a thing we just added on. We did that yesterday <laughs> in this process. Um, and we'll get to that one in a second as we, as we do another example. Um, the other thing that's just really cool is, is because of Google Earth, you can actually, um, you go to another stop. This is the Marcella Shale. Uh, famous for the fracking history. Uh, but look in the upper right panel. We put the panel in there, which is the street view. You can actually take this and you can um, uh, do a street view while you keep the other screen open. You can walk the outcrop the way the Google van was making pictures of the outcrop. Not perfect, but you can look around at the same time as you can also look on that screen over here. And, and if you don't like the view, then this particular view of, of, of street view is, is pretty, uh, pretty basic, of course. You can still, of course, have the regular field pictures in there. Uh, that's still there as well. And so you're not limited by, uh, by doing one or the other. All these layers are in there as you go forward. But I thought there's a lot of places where we have road stops. Why not use street view? And then you can actually uh, uh, do a lot. You can actually get pretty close if you want to. Uh, you can, of course, also go 360 degrees in as far as Google Earth gives you that 360 degrees functionality in that, in that particular way. So that's, uh, uh, that's the, um, uh, that part functionality. And sometimes the street view is, uh, is the last thing I'll show um, because it's also a spectacular structure. Um, the street view gives people a sense of what, what geology in the field really is when they're not in the field. This is, uh, let, let it zoom out for a second. Uh, the flyovers are always a little bit sort of like maybe not as comfortable unless you see them yourself. You can do them faster and slower. None of that we control. That's all controlled by Google Earth Web. Uh, the speed, you can set up all these things. But here's an outcrop that you look at a, um, I'll, I'll point it out. This is a big ramp anticline right over here. It sits on a thrust that's underneath here. The big structure right here of uh, Tuscarora sandstone. It's a uh, shallow dipping on the uh, westerly side, an easterly side, sorry, and it's steeply dipping on the westerly side. And here's the outcrop uh, from Google Earth, and here's the outcrop, so you can actually see it, what you would do if you go and try to go into the field. And at the same time, you can still have your voiceover. Voice narration for each stop can be found here. Obviously, I didn't put all the voices in for a number of reasons. In part, I don't have them in part because I want to keep it a little bit as a personalized uh, experience. And so, um, it, it essentially, it, it's a whole system where you can uh, uh, go back and, 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 and tweak this. Um, so, the most obvious thing that, uh, that, of course, you see all this and you think, wow, this is, it looks pretty nice and you probably spent years at this. Um, and uh, first of all, there's a guy called George Williams, who's the brains behind all this. He, was make, he wrote the code for this to actually do all this functionality. And the last thing I want to show, hopefully that works, is what you as a user need to know to make this happen for your own. I really wanted something that I could do myself on a, as I said, on a, on a, on a, on a Sunday afternoon. And so um, let me go you a few steps through that. Uh, I do one example, um, and everything is on this little block right over here. I, I wrote a simple block that has the, the stuff there. And what you'll see in the block is there are yellow areas. These yellow areas is where you come in. This is where you change the title. This is where you put in a whole lot of stuff. You put in the, the links to the pictures, the captions, but otherwise none of the stuff you touch. You just simply don't worry about it. You only change where you come in. Here's the voice section. Is your, your voice clip sits there. 
and here again is the descriptions. That's all you want to change. And so I'm sorry if I zoom. Let me just show you that how easy this can be done, provided it works. It's always tricky. Never show real-time technology, I'm told. Uh, it's always bound to go wrong. So I copy and paste. Hold on, if I get to the right one. Uh, one more, a little bit farther. Okay, here's the file. I uh, just control copy. I go back to this Google Earth environment and I say I want to make a new feature. The new feature, click on it, add a place mark. Let's take it right over here. Um, I call it test. Um, I have to edit the place. Now, this is where you have to pay attention. This is where everything go, goes different. The environment of Google Earth is not the same what we use. We use this little function right over here, which is very, it's built in. It's called switch to HTML. You take what I have, you copy and paste that, just straight copy and paste. You change the panel to a large panel. And then I pray this shows you all that you need to do to make that go. So I made this on the fly. This is what I just did. I, I had these links already built in, of course, but you can see this is not anywhere we saw before. And that's all you need to do. You just need to replace your figures, your captions, your voice. You copy and paste the, the, the HTML code. Don't touch it. Um, otherwise, and you can make the trip yourself. And that's really what I wanted to show. And I'll stop sharing so I can see again uh, what's, uh, what the questions are. Ben, thank you very much for presenting and also for saving us as a community probably a thousand hours of time. <laughs> Are there other questions? So do things there, just answering one of the things already there. That link should be correct. Now, there will be questions, people, let me answer a question that you have, but you don't ask me. Can you drape the geologic map over Google Earth? Yes, you can, but it becomes a very different project. It can no longer work very well on your phone. It no longer works very well on your tablet. It becomes a KML-based project. We're working on that. That's another version that I'll be working on with uh, Josh. But it doesn't have this relatively modest footprint of getting information. And so you have less trouble with Google Earth Web. Um, that's basically one thing that down the road would be cool. But it turns out that's not that straightforward. Google Earth Web is a voyage environment. It's show, show and tell. It is really less about functionality in that sense. Somebody asked about full screen images and retain zoom. Of all the things that you had that I showed, you can simply either right click on them to become full images, or you can just expand them like the GigaPan, like the, 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 the street views. You can click on those things. And what I wanted was always when you click on things that you go open a new window in your browser so you can always go back to where you came from. I really think that's the, that's that, the, I wanted to have a framework where you don't lose where you are. And so yes, you can make everything bigger, uh, we did other cool things. We put in rock samples for rotation and stuff like that. You, you can do more. I didn't want to show all the all the little things you can add to this. I wanted to give you the basic show and tell environment that we have. And Google Earth Pro is the desktop version. Somebody asked about that. Google Earth Pro is a completely different environment. That is software that's on your computer. It's very, very uh, instrument intensive. You can probably do this on Google Earth Pro, but now all your students and all the users need to load Google Earth and Pro, have it on their computer, load the KML file. And my game was to actually just have, have the link and have it work uh, straight out without having to have software issues that doesn't work on one machine, it's too slow on the other machine. If Google Earth Web works on your phone or your tablet on your desktop in the browser, it will, this, this, this project will work for them. And um, while Avery goes, could you share the URL to the blog when, whenever we're done with questions? Yeah, I will do that. All right, unless anybody has any other questions, I think Ben's addressed them all. Okay, then let's go ahead and switch on over. Thank you very much, Ben. You're welcome. And Avery, we're gonna have you switch on once Ben stops sharing screen. You can start sharing screen. I thought I stopped sharing screen. Oh, you probably have, there you go. All right, am I good? Yes, you're good and we can see it. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Avery Shinneman. Um, and thanks to Basil for the last minute ad on this. I promise I'll just take five minutes or less um, for a quick addition here. Uh, so I'm in the Earth System Science program at the University of Washington Bothell campus, which is a, a small commuter campus uh, close to the main Seattle campus of UW. Uh, and I've been using um, this app, Flyover Country, that I'll talk about to do students on self-guided field trips for a little while. And, and my motivation for that in the past has been that my students uh, on our campus frequently can't come to weekend field trips. So I usually, if I have a weekend field trip for uh, an introductory geology class, for example, I get half or less of my students who can come. Uh, so I've used this app to develop uh, a roadmap so students can go take these trips on their own uh, outside of the class time or outside of the field trip time whenever they can fit it in. And I've found that it has a good application right now because students, as it turns out, can still go outside uh, in this current environment. We just can't go outside together. Uh, so I'm going to switch over and see if there's a couple chat comments here. I'm going to see if I can see all at once, but I don't know that I can do that. So I might just, I might just plow through and get to the, the chat comments afterward. Um, so the app that I'm using is Flyover Country, which you might be familiar with. Um, it's a mobile app that's designed, the name comes from a design to look out the airplane window as you're flying over and see different localities uh, depicted in the app. It's free uh, and it's on both uh, Android and iOS platforms. Uh, this was developed with NSF funding by folks at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and it's been used for a number of different field trips now, not just in the big scale, but also on small scale walking field trips, driving field trips as well. So the perk to this right now is that we can ask students to go out and see the world in real life. Uh, in the class I'm teaching right now, I have offered for our field trip opportunity this quarter both virtual field trips, including uh, the Blacktail Canyon Grand Canyon field trip. That's one of our options. So it was great to see uh, Steve uh, and his group walk through that. Uh, but they can do that option or they can take a local field trip walking in one of our local parks. And in my class right now, about half the students have no interest whatsoever in being asked to go somewhere new and different. They just really don't want to deal with that right now. And about half the students were so excited to be asked to actually leave their homes right now uh, that they're really excited to go out and do something uh, and see something uh, really up close and personal. So the tool, the, the reason this tool is helpful, um, you could do self-guided field trips using paper, using Google Maps, using other things. This is helpful because it provides geolocation. So it's got the moving blue dot uh, like Google Maps or other mapping applications that students are familiar with. So they know they're in the right spot, which is both good from a safety perspective. You know that they are where you sent them. Uh, and because if you ask them to go to the park and look for the sandstone outcrop, who knows uh, what they might find, especially in an introductory geology class to look at uh, instead of what you want them to be looking at. So you know they're in the right spot. You can include commentary and figures and questions, and I'll show you that on the next slide in just a second. So you can really put in uh, a lot of what you might narrate uh, on an in-person trip. And what, it's, uh, what I'm using it for in this remote environment right now is that I can ask students to go out and make observations, measurements, um, pick up some sediment and feel what this is like, get the texture, and then they come back to a remote discussion group and they can actually compare their observations and have some of that real interaction that combines the remote learning environment with some, some real world um, tactile and, and physical observations. So this is what it would look like to a student. This is a field trip that I've developed on a public park uh, in Seattle. And so they have these purple locations, which are the localities that I've created. Uh, and then as they're moving along, they get the little blue, blue dot that tells them when they've gotten to the right spot and different maps, photos, uh, and questions can pop up. Uh, they can't answer it right now in the app. They actually have to write it down or re voice record it or something in a, in a different format to respond to those questions, but they can move along and sort of see what I would have shown them had I been there to walk along with them uh, and give them those uh, field trip outcrop tours uh, in person. Uh, you can see in the upper right there, there's a button for save for offline so they can download the full trip before they leave uh, if either data you know, costs are a concern or if um, coverage is, is not good in the area that you're in. So they can go take these walks, uh, sort of have those experiences and report back in a way that combines the, the real world and remote environment. I'll just put up a couple of these and I can put these links in the chat as well. Um, the download for this is flyovercountry.io for the apps, um, but there's another web page for entering information and there's a pretty intuitive just web-based interface that you can see on the right there to add figures, add stops. And as you do this, you see a center box there that says you should now see this view. So as you're adding things, you can see what it's looking like uh, in the app as you go. 
Uh, so the steps to do that, if you're interested, are to reach out and get an account with Flyover Country, and I can put that Google form link in the chat as well. And then once you have access, you can get into this admin section to create your own uh, stops and figures in there. There is also a, a, a sort of a tutorial on, there's both a tutorial to enter information in general and also a tutorial on cleaning up a PDF field guide. So the Flyover Country team, uh, Shane Loeffler in particular at the University of Minnesota, have been working on taking all the old uh, GSA uh, meeting field trips that are in PDF form and inputting them into Flyover Country. So a lot of those are in there already. There are existing field trip guides um, for a lot of those locations already in there. But if you have an existing guide, um, there's some ways to help you sort of clean up the text and import it pretty quickly into there. And then if you're just working from scratch uh, with new images and new text, there's a walkthrough tutorial for that as well. Um, so again, it's, it's been helpful to be able to get students um, locally out. It's harder if you've got students that are far flung across the country uh, or if they're uh, in places that, that getting out isn't practical and certainly it's an option to use with virtual environments. But if having students uh, take a walk or see a particular location close to you is something that you're interested in, this might be a tool uh, to think about. So uh, I promise to keep it short, so I'll just do that. And if people have questions about using it, I'm happy to answer them quickly. Uh, or offline afterwards. Thank you, Avery. That was great. Oh, and there's a question about the um, liability issues, which I did intend to mention. That depends, obviously, a lot on your institution. Uh, my institution, my dean has been very unconcerned about this and, and likens it to having students ask to go see an art museum on the weekend on their own or any other public place. And part of that is because I have restricted this to all public spaces. So these are all public parks, public trails, uh, one of them uses a series of bus stops, uh, so they're on public transit getting on and off three or four bus stops on a common route from campus to see um, a Kettle Lake, a large erratic, some other things that are just in the neighborhood there. Certainly you wouldn't want to be sending students to your hidey hole that's off on some you know, remote ranch somewhere that you have your secret access to. You want to be keeping this to public areas. Uh, and with that, I just have them sign a standard liability form, um, the kind you'd use if you were going to take them on a walk around campus or anything else. Uh, and that's, that's been acceptable to my institution, but certainly different institutions might view that differently. Avery, I would like you, while it's still going, to put the link into the Google form so that it'll be recorded with the rest of this recording so people who watch it later can put it in. Got it. I can do that. Great. Um, all right. And I, I guess I'm going to kind of, there we go. Thank you. Other questions for Avery? All right, I'm going to keep it to an hour, which we thank you, everybody, for getting us there, staying exactly on time. The ASU group sort of showed the highest level of sophistication with that stuff and how to do it almost professionally. Ben showed us sort of a, another level, and then Avery sort of showed us yet another level. So this is good. We sort of hit field camps and a variety of different um, amounts of work that you'd have to do beforehand to put in. But that, Every one of them was really great, so thank you all.